a video today talking about this. This is the 1984-1985 pattern combat uniform. Both uh, terms seem to be used interchangeably. Uh, I've referred to it as the 1984 pattern in the title and I'll continue to refer to it as that in the video. But this is exactly the same as the what is also referred to as the 1955 pattern combat uniform. And it would see the British Army through the end of the Cold War uh, and then you'd have further developments after the, the end of the Cold War. Uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union uh, in the early to mid 90s and then obviously the introduction of Soldier 95. But as I say this is um, the final Cold War combat uniform uh, and for a long time it was available as surplus. I would say four or five years ago it was still readily available as surplus. It's becoming a little bit less common now certainly as surplus is turned, still turns up at shows and so forth as, uh, on racks of, from traders and, and things like this but it's not as readily available as surplus clothing uh, as it used to be in the same way that, say, Soldier 95 still is. Um, and as such, if you're collecting British Cold War combat uniform, British Army uniform, I'd recommend having a, having a look for this. Uh, it differs from the earlier 1968 pattern uh, in several ways, uh, one of which is the fact that it has bellows pockets. The overall design is very similar uh, in terms of the layout of where the pockets are and so forth. But we do have, uh, now we have bellows pockets, which is a feature taken from uh, Arctic uh, windproof clothing which pre-existed pre um, so we have those there and that does give them a bit more volume although there are some complaints certainly some manufacturers of this some contract uh, runs of this uh, there were some complaints that the pockets weren't uh, stitched uh, on as, as um, securely as they should be should we say because there's a bit of quality control issue there but uh, an, an, a neat addition to design it does give you greater carrying capacity in the smock of course the same goes for the lower pockets they are also bellows pockets as you can see there uh, and akin, uh, akin to 1968 pattern, we have the draw cord at the waist and at the bottom there. The collar is the same simple open collar with the single button, so it can be buttoned up close to the top buttonhole and button there in the same way as 1968 pattern can. Uh, a zip underneath, of course, now uh, a cheaper plastic zip in place of the heavyweight uh, metal zip of the 1968 pattern. And the same style of buttons, the same green four hole buttons you can see there. Um, Epaulets on each shoulder. We've not yet moved to having the the uh, rank tabs, the uh, rank tabs on front and back, uh, as would happen with later combat clothing, or certainly on the front. Uh, that was a feature of the windproof clothing, of course. Not yet carried across to this. You still have the the epaulets up on the shoulders there. The cuff adjustment uh, is facilitated by a Velcro tab uh, in place of buttons. So that's uh, another sort of design feature that's been brought in from uh, windproof clothing. There is the fact that the the cuffs. Um, adjust with uh, Velcro, which is convenient if you're wearing gloves and so forth and you wish to cinch the cuff in. It's a lot easier than trying to fiddle around with buttons. You, of course, don't have to remove the gloves in order to do this. The cloth is a cotton modal mix uh, as opposed to the cotton sateen, which had seen uh, most of the production run of 1968 pattern through until late production runs, 77, 78, um, around there. You then it moved on to cotton modal and we'll have a look now you can this is often this sort of darker cloth is often associated with the 1984 pattern uh, certainly this production uh, of combat clothing comes in a, a dark what would appear to be a slightly darker dpm print than earlier uh, combat clothing the night early runs of 1968 pattern in pure cotton but the late runs of 1968 pattern actually do display this darker pattern which we'll have a look at now so we have here to contrast a late run uh, of 1968 pattern combat trousers you can see the 1968 pattern we have the dressing pocket here on the leg and the two uh, leg pockets lower down and this is made in cotton modal uh, as opposed to pure cotton and this of course exhibits essentially the same uh, print of DPM uh, so the, the darkening of the colours seems to correspond to the change in cloth the change in the material that these were made from uh, cotton modal uh, dries a little better than pure cotton um, and also it's a little bit tougher as well uh, but it, the modal fibres are very similar to cotton, so it's nice and soft. So, as I say, it's a compromise there in one way uh, from, from pure cotton uh, to improve the drying qualities a little bit, or, or certainly I, I believe that was the intention. Uh, but the trousers from the 1984 pattern do differ quite considerably, and I will have a look at a pair of those now. OK, here we have the trousers from the 1984 pattern combat suit, made again in this, this cotton modal mix. Uh, these are slightly faded, but they, they would originally have been in the darker deep ground print associated with this, this material. Um, move to the plastic zip at the fly here, again, as the zip on the smock is too. Uh, slightly flimsier. Uh, the design uh, definitely takes into account modern materials. 
the manufacturing was not as good uh, perhaps as the 1968 pattern was, which led to a lot of complaints of these being less durable. Uh, the bellows pockets, of course, are one on each leg. And the, the issue again with these is because of the manufacturing wasn't as perhaps as good, uh, certainly in some contract runs, these could tear and rip and pull off. And uh, there was a, a lot of complaints made. It's certainly something which turns up now from veterans who wore this uniform. Uh, they did not like it uh, as much as the 1968 pattern in terms of durability, at least. Although the design did try to draw in elements from more specialised clothing uh, to give more capacity in the pockets and so forth. At the uh, waist, we have belt loops all the way around. Um, obviously, button belt loops, as we've had on previous combat uniform patterns. Uh, there are no longer any brace buttons, at least not in this pair. Uh, as you can see there, there's no brace buttons around the waist there. And therefore, these are to be kept up with a belt or using these side adjusters here. These are the metal side adjusters being very similar to those used on the lightweight trousers. Looking at the back here, we do have two rear patch pockets just sewn on, no bellows here. Uh, one, on each, uh, one on each hip there. And these uh, do obviously give you a bit of extra carrying capacity at the back. And of course, you do have the standard hip pockets there. Um, as you can see in their uh, standard hip pocket, one on each side. So uh, that is the, uh, that's the combat trousers. That's the design of combat trousers uh, that were part of the 1984 pattern combat uniform. One thing that is missing from this design compared to the 1968 pattern, of course, is the dressing pocket is no longer here on the leg. And this is something that had been carried over from battle dress. Uh, so a very long lived part of British uh, uniform, uh, but something that would disappear on here. And we'll go back to talk about the jacket a little bit more now, the combat smock rather and we'll talk about uh, the movement of this onto the smock. So as we've said, the dressing pocket is now missing off the leg of the trousers. It's been moved, it's been moved to the smock, and we'll have a look at this in just a moment. In addition to the four outside pockets here and the internal pockets, uh, we also have arm pockets, and we'll have a look at the one on the left arm first. On the left arm, you can see here a pen pocket, a little utility pocket on the arm there. Um, they used for a little uh, pocket, you've got a section stitched off, which will allow you to easily to store a pen in there. Uh, and I say a useful place to keep bits and pieces. On the right arm, we have here a, a more uh, voluminous pocket, which is made with uh, bellows design. This will take a field dressing. It will take a first field dressing, the old type of first field dressing, and it will also take the joint service dressing, be it the large or the small joint service dressing, uh, will fit in there. By way of demonstration, I have here a large joint service dressing, the 20 centimetre, 20 centimetre by 19 centimetre uh, type and it will fit in the dressing pocket, as you can see here. So that will fit quite neatly in there on the arm, as you can see. So what we'll do now is, I'll do the usual thing of we'll have a look at the inside of the jacket, uh, turned inside out on the mannequin, look at the inside of the trousers, and then we'll have a look at some close-ups of the labels so taking a look at the inside of the uniform, you can see it's partially lined with uh, another layer of DPM fabric. So with the white in a white unprinted face turned around, so the lining is DPM out. This would actually cause a problem later on. Um, it was recognized that with less lining material, that not having a full green lining inside, the white uh, areas of material showing could cause cam camouflage issues, say if clothing were hung up to dry and so forth in the field. So later prints obviously would start to be printed, they then cloth had to be dyed first before being printed so that it had a base camouflage colour uh, and this would happen with the early 90s combat clothing. That's just a little aside. You can see in here we have the two internal pockets which are quite voluminous. Uh, you can see in there hopefully, it gives you some idea. They are quite, uh, quite big, got a good bit of volume to them. And then you have the half lining down to the waist, down to the waist drawer cord here and obviously the lower part of the lining there forms the channel for the waist draw cord. And you can see we've got some just to the top of the arm here and then the arms are otherwise unlined all the way down. You can see here the full length uh, plastic zip as well, which comes down to, well, full length. It's just a couple of inches off the bottom there, as you can see. Um, so that's, uh, that's the front of the uh, inside of the uniform there. One thing to have a quick look at at the side here, you can see the internal draw cord at the waist and it fastens at the side here, uh, which means obviously that you're not having to tie it at the waist once you fasten the jacket or as you fasten the jacket, you can cinch it in and leave it tied at the sides there. Neat little feature of the design. Looking at the back here, the first thing that stands out is this large lined area here. And what it actually is, is a large poacher's pocket at the rear, somewhat synonymous with British combat clothing of the Cold War era. Uh, obviously two buttons in this instance to fasten that up there. And a good place to carry soft kit. Um, I'm not sure how commonly that was done, but certainly 
uh, something you could do should you wish to. Gives you a bit of extra carrying capacity in the jacket itself, in the smock itself. And then obviously we have the lining material over the shoulders here again, the DPM. But you can see on the inside face, it's just the two faces turned together, the two uh, white faces of the cloth turned together. We can see the label at the top here and a hanger. Uh, there is a coat hanger there as well. And we'll have a detailed look at the label in just a minute. But first of all, we'll have a look at the trousers uh, turned inside out. So this is the inside of the front of the trousers. And you can see here the two hip pockets. Um, you can see they're partially aligned. They're lined basically down to the knee there. And then you can see the white interior of the DPM printed material from there down, down below. This is something that would be a problem, particularly when the lining was reduced even further. And in the 90s, when that happened, uh, there was a, an instruction that uh, DPM cloth was to be dyed, uh, was to be pre-dyed a tan or a, a drab colour with DPM printed over that, which is why you get some interesting colour variations in the 90s as well. Uh, it's not uh, something that I would stress in this video, the changes in DPM print, uh, although there are some changes to specification, they don't tend to be a new patterns. It tends to be that there's a change in material or a change in printing method, and that leads to a change in, in uh, colour and so forth. And similarly with the, the sparse desert DPM prints and things like this, it's manufacturing variations as opposed to something generally speaking, specified by the MOD. Um, although the MOD did change DPM prints a little bit over time as well, but there's a mix of things affecting that, which is why there appear to be so many different variations. So that's the inside of the trousers, as I say. Um, looking at the rear here, you can see the back of the lining, you can see the label in the, uh, the, the uh, right rear here, as you would wear them. We'll have a look at that in more detail in a minute. And again, you can see the half lining coming down here, the internal stitching of the uh, rear pockets there. Here you can see the label of the smock and it's simply termed smock combat DPM. Uh, any uh, pattern notations disappeared and as you can see we now have the NATO and the metric sizing. So uh, the NATO size up above and then the British metric sizing 180.96 uh, underneath. Here you can see the label on the 1984 pattern combat trousers and unfortunately it's not very clear but they are labelled trousers combat. Beneath that we have the NATO stock number and then we have the NATO size followed by the British metric size beneath that. And then unfortunately the rest of the label is pretty much faded away. So there's not a lot of detail that can be seen there. So there we have a look at the 1984 pattern combat uniform. Uh, as I say, the, the last combat uniform, the last standard issue combat uniform uh, issued to the British Army during the Cold War uh, before de further developments in the 1990s and obviously trials items as well. But the last standard issue combat uniform, as I say, not as common as they used to be in terms of picking them up. Uh, still very cheap and relatively plentiful, but I would recommend picking them up now uh, if you want to, uh, while they are still cheap and relatively plentiful, uh, because you can certainly see them going the way of other combat patterns. Uh, partly because, as I myself had a pair of trousers which I wore to death uh, as working trousers, they were my old cadet trousers. And as I say, had I thought about it more at the time, I would probably have kept them and bought another pair of surplus trousers, some other, some other description, some more modern pattern to wear. But as I say, that's what happens with practical clothing like this, is it gets bought, it gets used as outdoor clothing, working clothing, etc., and it gets used up. So uh, as I say, if you wish to preserve them, if you wish to have some in your collection, I'd recommend looking out for a set of this combat uniform now. Uh, that's everything I wanted to cover in this video, I think. Um, as usual, uh, there's a Patreon link down below uh, for those who uh, like my videos enough to want to contribute towards the channel. Uh, very much appreciate. There's also a PayPal link where you can make a one-time donation if you wish to. Uh, thank you very much to those of you who supported me in both those, both those ways. It's very much appreciated. There's also, of course, the Facebook and the Instagram, pa uh, Instagram page associated with the channel. Uh, I recommend looking at both of those, particularly Facebook. I post on there about upcoming events and so forth that we're going to. It's a good place to keep up with what's going on. Uh, also, there are lots of photographs and things to look at as well. Um, if you like my videos and you'd like to see more, then I always appreciate people subscribing. Uh, it's very much appreciated, as I say. Uh, obviously, link for that down below. Press the subscribe button. Make sure you hit the little notification button as well, the little bell will notify you when I upload future videos. Uh, but that's everything for this video, as I said before. So until next time, bye for now.